G'day everyone, it's The Troutman here and the topic of today's video is Who Killed the Australian Car? Holden famously had close to half the new car market to itself back in the 50s. Around the 60s import duties were as high as 50%, leading to masses of makers producing everything from Datsuns to Volkswagens in Australian factories. The decline of protectionism over subsequent decades resulted in an exodus, particularly in the 1990s with the loss of important models like the Ford Laser, Nissan Pulsar and Toyota Corolla. In 2018, though there remains a token 5% import tariff, free trade agreements are in place with Thailand, Korea, the US and Japan. Ironically, the new German-made Holden Commodore is among a minority of cars to be affected by this. Japan makes for an interesting contrast. Local Japanese makers account for 90% of domestic sales according to the Japanese Automobile Dealers Association. Japan no longer has any import tariffs on cars, though its industry was supported to establish dominance prior to such taxes being removed. Other uprising success stories, such as Korea, followed a similar path of combining domestic dominance and high volume competitive exports. The 1993 Ford Falcon was technologically competitive with much costlier imports with available features like ABS that were otherwise hard to find for its new price of little over 25 grand at the time. For approximately the same money, a base Camry executive of the time, though admittedly a fantastically well-built car, offered a mere 92 kilowatt four-cylinder engine and had no ABS option. Both cars offered two extra cylinders as a modestly priced option offering buyers a choice between a silky Lexus V6 or a rugged American V8 in the high 20-something price bracket. By 2016, however, the Falcon had underwent an unmistakable death spiral of dwindling sales, diminishing developmental budgets, and a decimation of innovation causing further sales decline. For 36400, it was now in a different price bracket, swarming with competitive imports of all classes, Money was being lost on each car sold, and its former days as a technologically competitive model were long gone, despite a turbo four-cylinder option that was actually no cheaper than the traditional four-litre inline six. In 2016, a base Camry cost 26490 effectively costing the same money as 13 years prior in defiance of inflation, whilst boasting generous lashings of standard equipment that were now expected. For barely over 30 grand, a high-tech hybrid model that used only 5.2 litres per 100 kilometres, less than a 1.3 litre manual Yaris at the time, was available. From the 1960s until the early 2000s, it was normative for Australians to either identify as Holden or Ford fans, a dichotomy analogous to modern-day Samsung versus iPhone brand loyalty. Fat Cat executives drove up market models like the Ford Fairlane, basic Falcons and Commodores were the mainstay of fleets and families, while sports models were popular with enthusiasts. The uprising of the car-like four-wheel drive wagon trend in the 90s was from the outset a concerning trend. In 1998, the AU Falcon's combination of a taxi interior with an utterly unloved exterior appearance damaged the car's public image considerably, and it never really recovered. The trend towards affluent and image-conscious buyers gravitating towards German luxury models increasingly left Holden's demographic as stereotypically the less educated and jingoistic masses, to say nothing of anti-social young males whose crass brand loyalty only defamed the Holden line in the eyes of the self-respecting middle-class public. Australia's other car, the Camry, was also stigmatised by private buyers for its lack of emotional appeal. The bygone era of peer pressure to buy locally made cars had if anything been inverted by these socio-cultural changes. In the WM Caprice's career, the most notorious example of GM's lacklustre attitude towards resolving design glitches was the rear side glass trim. The problem was weak glue holding it on and the chrome part commonly fell off. Replacement costs were high, as it was necessary to purchase the entire glass assembly. When quizzed by owners, Holden flatly denied any problem. 
Even by the time of the Caprice PPV of 2011, nothing had been done to resolve the issue, resulting in a barrage of embarrassing imagery of Australia's flagship export with the exterior trim piece missing. It appears that the WN series, seven years later, resolved the problem at last. Enthusiasts learned to attach the trim piece themselves with double-sided tape, a simple solution that could have been done all along from the factory. However, the winner of GM's fault denial goes to the 1997 VT Commodore's independent rear suspension. The VT was based on the chassis of the Opel Omega of Europe. Someone at Holden decided to remove a linkage from the rear suspension to save money, despite the Australian version being larger, heavier and far more powerful. As a result, the rear wheels of the VT had extreme camber, resulting in a somewhat silly appearance, inferior traction, compromised wet weather safety, and rapid wear on the inside of the rear tyres. The Series 1 WH Caprice of the time was fitted with self-leveling rear suspension as a workaround. Three years later, the VX model was released. The rear suspension design remained, and Holden publicly denied any problem with it. Then, in 2001, the minor VX Series 2 finally saw the missing suspension link added. Holden dubbed it Control Link and marketed it as a new feature. It was hard not to be nauseated by the charade. Before buying my WM I had a VT myself and I was able to work around the issue by purchasing a rear camber kit for several hundred dollars. These are merely well documented examples of a pervasive culture that burned many customers who only asked that they not be left high and dry when faults were found with their vehicles. If you are wondering why I put the blame on GM and not merely its Holden outpost, it is because there is firm evidence that this is a global issue. Starting in 2014, GM recalled nearly 30 million cars for an ignition switch defect that was blamed for 124 deaths. The fault had been known internally by GM for at least a decade prior to the recall being declared. Sound familiar? It is quite likely that any disgruntled Holden buyer who bought a Japanese import in protest would simply never have returned. Tony Abbott became Prime Minister in 2013 and wasted little time in withdrawing support for the Australian car industry. Had Labor won, they had promised to redouble efforts to save the local industry. Instead, the domino effect of announcements, Ford, Holden and Toyota, commenced. Abbott replaced his armoured Caprice with a BMW and the rest is history. The struggle of the Chevrolet Caprice PPV export program was one reason used to dismiss the viability of local manufacturing. However, this particular period of time saw an unusually high Australian dollar, a situation that soon reversed and would have allowed a flood of well-priced imports to the US had the death warrant not already been signed. In 2012, one Australian dollar was worth more than one US dollar. At the time of this video's publishing, one AUD is worth a mere 74 US cents. The media was also instrumental in cultivating ignorant outrage and swaying the tide of public opinion against local manufacturers. The proud successes of the industry, such as the masses of Toyota Camrys and Chevrolet Caprices all over Middle Eastern roads, were utterly unknown to the Australian public. Instead, simplistic figures portraying the Australian car industry as a multi-billion dollar, futile drain on taxpayer dollars avoided accounting for counterbalancing factors such as the employment of 50,000 people, the value of exports and the minimal impact to the budget. Consider this graph from my 2015 tax return. Underlined in red is industry assistance, as it applies to all industries including the then functional Holden, Ford and Toyota factories. It is clearly a minimal chunk, even in a worst case scenario, which demonstrates just how needlessly destructive the sensationalising of the media on this issue was. I cannot present a truly comprehensive assessment of the economic value of having a continued Australian car industry, as it would need to account for dozens of complex interlinked factors such as income and other taxes paid, the need for welfare for many laid off auto industry employees and so on and all of this in an ever-changing, fluid economic environment. It is worth noting that in contrast to Tony Abbott's brand of brash right-wing politics, industry protectionism overseas has seen a resurgence, namely in the United Church. God bless you, God bless Israel, God bless the Palestinians, and God bless the United States. 
But rather than delve into impossibly complex economics, my personal conviction is that Australia should have the self-esteem to want to build and export products of ostensible significance. Shipping raw materials to China might be great for the national balance sheet, but war-torn African nations can do that too. Australia may not put man on the moon, but at least we could put a few Commodores on the streets of Houston. The sheer passion that many enthusiasts around the world have felt, particularly for Holden's exports, demonstrated the success with which a single platform was adopted for many enormously varied roles, a fact that I've sought to highlight in my previous videos. The enthusiasm enjoyed by Holden in these international communities contrasts sadly with the media's narrative parroted by the ignorant Australian public about Holden making outdated cars that no one wants while being funded by taxpayers. There is no doubt that a significant evolution was needed in order to achieve a more sustainable and profitable business model, though the genuine uniqueness of the car's character in a sea of lookalikes meant that it was worth the effort. The Camry just needed to soldier on into the excellent new generation. To finish with, I give you America's Cadillac CT6, admittedly a more upmarket model than the WP Caprice that might have been, but nonetheless a tantalising indicator of what a new generation of Holden would have offered. In addition to the familiar 3.6 litre V6 that was originally a joint development between Holden and Cadillac, it is available with efficient 8 and 10 speed automatic transmissions, as well as other engines ranging from an economical turbo 4 cylinder, a plug-in hybrid electric powertrain and a unique twin turbo V8. In the case of the V8, Australia would have instead been served by the latest generation 5 small block, which ranges from a 313 to 563 kilowatts output, depending on the variant. The latest version of GM's active fuel management is far more sophisticated than its predecessor, enabling so equipped V8s to run on as few as one cylinders. Other features like auto emergency braking and panoramic roof options would have been expected on a new Caprice too. These arguments may be emotional rather than logical, but there is a time and place for this in any developed society. That is also the reason why I would prefer to play the role of historian, sharing the great stories of the local car industry, rather than focusing on the unfortunate outcomes of what I regard as a poor decision. Thank you for watching this video. Please let me know what you think in the comments section below, and consider subscribing so you don't miss out on future content.